All right, thank you everyone for joining us. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. Today we have Opto Sigma, who's one of OSC's industrial affiliates joining us. And they have a couple of presentations for us today from some of their staff. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass to Yoko and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about the company and about what's going on. Thanks. Hi everybody, my name is Yoko Di Francia. I'm the marketing manager to uh, Opto Sigma is, uh, located in the Southern California, sunny um, Santa Ana, near Orange County. Um, we are, are one of the leading uh, manufacturers of the optics, uh, of the mechanics and motion controls and systems like that. Today, we're gonna uh, have a two presentations. One is an overview of linear stages by Rick uh, Sebastian, he's a product manager, and, and another one is um, on the brand new stainless steel MHX miller mount. It will be done by a director of sales marketing, Dan Dennison. So I would like to introduce uh, Rick. Please go ahead. Yeah, all right. Well, um, my name is Rick Sebastian, and I'm the product manager for Opto Sigma. I um, just want to say thank you to everybody online. Thank you for joining us uh, in this presentation. I um, hope everyone is staying well. And uh, so with that, I'd just like to start. Um, this presentation, we want to talk a little bit about linear stages. And um, these, are, these are products that are used quite frequently in optics labs. And so part of the, you know, the, the main thrust of the presentation is familiarity and in a way kind of assistance in how to select these products. So with that, I, you know, I think one of the best ways to start with uh, a presentation on linear stages is actually to talk about uh, degrees of freedom. And we know, you know, we know in 3D space, um, there, there are a total of six degrees of freedom that we have to deal with. And, and those are typically used you know, when you think about how do you align, you know, optics or you align any, anything that needs alignment. And so degrees of freedom, they're, they're, they're six, but they're broken down into two groups. One are the linear degrees of freedom, typically referred to as X, Y, and Z directions from a Cartesian coordinate. And then you take rotation about each of those <clears throat> linear degrees of freedom and you get angular degrees of freedom. And those are typically known as pitch, yaw, and roll. And so uh, some, sometimes they're referred to as azimuth and elevation, but it just depends on, on where you're coming from. So we've talked about degrees of freedom. So now here's the next thing. We have a linear translation stage. What's the job of a translation stage? And when you think about it from the standpoint of six degrees of freedom, the function of a linear stage is actually to constrain motion to desired directions. Well, what does that mean really? So think about for a, a single axis stage that travels one direction, all the degrees of freedom except for one are constrained. So the only unconstrained degree of freedom is the X axis. And that means that all the other five degrees of freedom, so Y, Z, roll, pitch, and yaw, those are constrained. So a linear stage will just move in one direction. But the bigger implication here is that any motion in a constrained direction will contribute to deviation from the ideal trajectory. What does that really mean? What am I talking about? That's error. So, so error is the, 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 the part of the stage that, that you, you, you wanna pay close attention to, but those are the directions you do not want to go in. And so real quickly, that a lot of times, the figure of merit here is, is straightness of travel. So the, the better a stage travels uh, in, its, in, in really good straightness, the better it is. And typically what, what I show here is that you know, for depending on the type of bearing used, and there, there are three or four different types, but I just threw this down at the bottom here, a dovetail type stage will have between 60 and 160 arc seconds of straightness of travel. Ball bearing is a little bit better, between 20 and 60. 
and a cross roller bearing is typically less than 20. Um, I've thrown this in here kind of for a number so that you can think about them through the presentation. I'll be talking in more detail about the types of bearing ways uh, further into the, uh, into the pages. So now that we kind of know what the linear stage does, let's look at some of the steps we take in the selection process of these stages. So typically speaking, when you're looking at stages and, and degrees of freedom, they're really broken down into the different configurations that provide the degrees of freedom that you're looking for. And, and since these are linear stages, they're broken down as shown here. So you have, they can be purchased as an x-axis stage, which is one degree of freedom. You can, they're configured um, as x, y. So you have two degrees of freedom, linear degrees, um, orthogonal to each other. Then there's an x, y, z. Now you have three degrees of freedom, of course, still orthogonal. And then the last two here, the z-x and, I'm sorry, the z-axis and the z-x, those are the individual components of uh, vertical travel and then vertical and horizontal. So these are your typical options when it comes to selecting uh, linear stages. Now let's get into a little bit more detail here. What's shown here on this slide are a lot of the attributes um, in detail um, as far as what are your options for uh, a linear stage. These are all the things you really need to look at. So the first item there is what we just talked about is the degrees of freedom. So you have XZ, XY, XZ, and XYZ. But the other things you have to consider and the other options you have are with regard to, let's say, stage material. So when it comes to stage material, you have several options. You can see aluminum there, typically aluminum is black anodized. You also have brass. You have alloy steel, which is typically harder and stronger than stainless steel. Um, you have stainless steel, of course, and those are typically used in clean room in, uh, environments. And so those are your general options with regard to material. Now, another important thing is bearing guides. And typically when you're out in the market, the most common types are ball bearings. Another common one is a dovetail type bearing. Um, another one that's less common, but still out there are cross roller bearings. And there's another type of bearing that's a uh, super high end bearing. Um, it's what we call the EXC or extended contact bearing. And I have more detail on that a uh, little bit into the presentation. Uh, another thing you have to consider, of course, is your threading. You know, do you want, are you working in an imperial lab or are you working in a metric lab? Okay. And now we get down to stage size. And stage size is important because it, there's correlation between stage size, travel range, and load capacity. Those things tend to go together. And the, and the correlation is this. The larger the stage size, typically, the longer the travel range, and the higher the load capacity. Okay, so those things, they, they all kind of go together. Um, next thing you want to consider here is drive type. So they can, they're, they're typically sold with either micrometers, uh, adjustment screws if you need more space, and in some cases you, you can get them with differential micrometers if you need super high resolution. And there's also a couple other types that are rack and pinion type drives or worm gear drives. Another important thing to look at is where is your actuator going to be located? And with translation stages, you can get them either on the side of the stage or you can get them in the center. And one of the reasons why, you know, why would we have two different locations? One of the big reasons is really space. Typically a center drive translation stage takes up more space and a side drive tends to take up less space. So you wanna consider that in, in the process of selecting your stage. Now, as I mentioned before, load capacity is a very big issue here as well. So, you know, you, you want to know about what your stage is going to take as far as load capacity. But there's one other very important um, load capacity attribute, and that is called um, moment load capacity. And that's when you have a load that is not centered over your stage. And so there are a few companies out there, and it, it, Opto Sigma is one of them, we actually go and we calculate what the moment load capacity is for each of our stages. And that's really important to have if you're gonna be loading a stage eccentrically or off the center. 
Uh, the last item here in the red circle is tra the travel straightness group. And, and based on your bearing type, you can get super low or super good straightness to travel. And if it's not as important, uh, different bearings will uh, give you other benefits, but typically not as good straightness to travel. So it, it really all depends on the type of application uh, that you have. The last item here is on, the, on this list is the compatible mounting holes. And the compatible mounting holes typically, of course, go with the size of the stage. But the important thing to know is that not all stages will mount on an optical table, say a table you have in the lab. And so you really want to check that. Um, typically, um, the smallest stage that is available for mounting on an optical table is about 65 by 65 millimeters in size, or about maybe three by three or two and a half by two and a half, something like that. But you always want to check the specs to make sure that if you have a metric table, that the mounting threads are M6 on, I think it's 50 millimeter hole pattern. And if it's uh, imperial, then it's quarter 20 on two inch centers. So definitely something to check before you buy your stage. All right, so those are some of the attributes with regards to stages. Now, as I mentioned before, we we're gonna talk a little bit about bearing ways and which, what are the options that you have when you select. And what I have here on the slide here is three of the most popular bearing ways out there. And they're arranged in kind of a good, better, and best uh, configuration. So what I want to do is just kind of go through each one of them and, and kind of illustrate their benefits and, uh, and their shortcomings, because they're not all for all applications. So the first one I want to talk about is the dovetail bearing way. And you can see on the side of the picture I've indicated the type of contact that the bearing has. And so for a dovetail bearing way, it's got planar contact. Um, there's a term called elastic averaging, which is how these things work. It's basically the averaging of the, the surface, of the bearing surface uh, is used, I guess, and, and the way this bearing works. So advantages, these typically tend to be low cost. Okay, these are dovetail bearings, very, very low cost. One of the reasons is there's no intermediate roller or ball in between the top and bottom plate. The other good thing about them is they hold really, really heavy loads. So if you have something that's uh, super heavy, these are the ones to use. But there are disadvantages. Now, one of the first ones is poor sensitivity. And that means you, your smallest incremental movement is not gonna be as good as on some of the other stages. And the other part is your straightness of travel, and we talked about that at the beginning, not gonna be that good, not gonna be good. So, if, so here you have it. So if you have an application that needs certain things and doesn't, like in these particular cases, if you need something with good straightness and good sensitivity, this is not the stage, but if you're looking for low cost and heavy loads, this is a really good stage for that. Last item there is shock resistance because there's no intermediate bearing structure in these. They can hold up pretty well the shock loads, and they're, they're uh, I won't say indestructible, but pretty darn close. So the next item, ball bearing stages. Okay, these are gonna be the most common uh, type of bearing stage that you have in a lab. And the reason is, is because <clears throat> they kind of are the hybrid of the best, you know, the, the highest end and the lowest end. They have the, the advantages of all. So they have good, reasonable mid-range cost. They can hold reasonable mid-range loads. They have really good sensitivity because of the ball bearing mechanism. They have pretty good straightness. And I put also on here low maintenance, and well, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. But this, is, this type of bearing way is the most common one because it serves, uh, it serves so many of the attributes so well. But now let's say you need a little higher performance. And, and the way to do that is you go to the cross roller bearing way. And the cross roller bearing, in, in contrast to the ball bearing, when you look at the contact point, a ball bearing basically contacts with a single point. However, a cross roller bearing, the contact point is more of a line. And because of that, you get certain advantages. And one of them is you're really 
good straightness of travel. And the other one is you typically can support heavier loads with this type of bearing. But some of the disadvantages are the cost tends to be a little bit higher. And as I mentioned before, it's kind of strange. These require more maintenance. And the reason is, is because if you think about a cross roller bearing being kind of a cylinder rather than a ball, the cylinder has the effect of, in a, in a sense, steamrolling contamination into the bearing way. And over time, that bearing way will need to be cleaned and maintained. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're using a cross roller bearing. They have really great performance, but just make sure they're st they stay in a very, very clean environment. And then um, as time permits, that they do receive maintenance. So those are the three main uh, bearing types that we have, but there, there is actually one more type, and this is the one I really wanna talk about. It's a, it's a type of bearing called extended contact. And what's really unique about it is that the, the, the bearing ways are actually machined into the stage themselves. And what this ends up doing is it ends up making for the best, highest performance stage um, out there. Um, we tested it on many fronts and we found out with all our stages, it came out the best in height profile, straightness to travel, load capacity, and bending stiffness. So it's, it's a really, really high-end, top-notch stage. You can see in the image right here, this is kind of the, con the construction of it. Um, there's a little bit more detail I wanna show you on some of the other slides. So let me just pop into that real quick. This is really the key advantage. This is where the design shows up and where it shows its strengths in comparison to a standard stage. So what I show is on the left, a standard stage. And when you take it apart, you can see the different pieces here. It's got a lot of screws. It's got separate bearing ways and, of course, separate stages. So when you add it all up, there's eight different parts and 32 screws. But when you use this extended contact uh, mechanism, Look what happens. Because the bearing ways are actually integrated into the stage, the top and bottom uh, plates of the stages themselves, there's only four parts. There's a top plate, a bottom plate, and two uh, bearing ways, or uh, bearing rows. That's it, and four screws. That's all there is. And when you're talking about stability and mechanical things, the fewer parts means the fewer interfaces, which means there's less things to move and you end up with much better stability and much better performance. Um, so one of the things, you know, we, we see this stuff a lot, you know, and, but you know what's, what's really interesting is to put this stuff to the test. You know, so it's a, it's a really cool design, but let's really put these guys to the test. And so we did that. Um, we took one of these stages and we had uh, our uh, sales director drive his car on top of these stages to prove how good they were. We didn't know for sure. We didn't know what was gonna happen, but we had to find out. And let me just show you this, uh, this video presentation. I hope it goes through, um, but yeah, I'm gonna give it a click right now. Is that coming through? You've probably heard that Optimus Sigma steel extended contact stages can hold a lot of weight and that they're highly stiff. We're going to try to prove it and we're going to put this BMW on top of four steel translation stages. Let's see how it works. We're putting one stage underneath each tire. So let's see what we have here. Pretty smooth.
so anyway, yeah, so we we uh, we did this test here, and you know what? That that entire car that you saw was supported by four of these uh, EXC extended contact translation stages. And you can see that um, Dan was literally pushing the entire car with a single hand and they were sliding perfectly smoothly along, along their path. So it was, uh, it was quite a surprise to us, but we had our suspicions that these things would work just fine. So um, just wanted to show you that. Uh, let me just move on here with the presentation. Um, so we, we talked about, a lot about the bearings and, and so on and so forth. So here's kind of the, uh, the summary part right here, um, just with all the different four bearing mechanisms here. Um, each one has its benefits. So you can see the one we just saw, it's the EXC is, is the technology that we use on our best stages, for example. As we talked about cross roller bearing stages, they have a really good balance of straightness and load capacity. Ball bearing stages, they have the best cost-effective solution for standard research applications. So those are gonna be your probably most common stages in your lab. And then finally, the dovetail uh, bearing stage, um, which has the benefits of kind of a set and forget type of uh, mechanism. So um, for these, uh, you can see the, the material typically for these types of stages, uh, extended contact is always steel. Um, cross roller bearings typically use aluminum as do ball bearings and then dovetail stages um, are almost exclusively made of brass because brass has um, a very low friction, uh, low coefficient of friction to allow the uh, mechanism to go smoothly. Um, when you talk about the platform sizes, um, we pretty much or platform sizes are available in most of the popular sizes. So now we talked about earlier also the comparison of each one of these and, and just to kind of illustrate which type performs the best. Now there's no one stage that, that wins everything and that's why we, we have different types available. But um, you can see here the, the EXC, the, the extended contact stage for most of the attributes and most, most of the performance attributes, it does the best job. However, for cross roller bearing, um, it has the best um, mass to weight ratio, right? For ball bearings, um, sliding friction, well, it ties, but the sliding friction is among the lowest. And of course, for uh, dovetail stages, the shock loading is the best and the price pricing is the best. So this is kind of more of a quantitative uh, analysis of each of the different types, but you can see there, there is, there's one that kind of is, is head and shoulders above the rest, but no one type owns the whole picture. So one of the last things I'd wanna close in on here is um, Z travel translation stages. And, and the reason for that is, is because there are quite a few options, more than you'd expect out there. And what I want to show here is they're really divided up by the mounting surface and the translating surface. And so um, at, at least at Opto Sigma, we have three different versions. And so if you look at the table here, actually look, if you look up at the uh, outline, you can see that the first type is, has a horizontal mounting surface and a horizontal base. That's the part that is in the first item in the table. The second one has a vertical mounting surface, but a horizontal base. And the third one has a vertical mounting surface and a vertical base. And so why, why, why so many of them? Well, each one has its own specialty, its own main advantage. So the first one with horizontal base and mounting surface, it's got the highest load capacity. So that's good. So if you have an application that has requires higher load, that's the one to pick. If you are looking for, if you need a very small footprint, the vertical, uh, the stage with vertical mounting surface and horizontal base is the one to pick. And finally, if you need a super slim profile, the last one is the best. It's a vertical mounting surface with a vertical base. So just know that when you're looking for a vertical travel stage, you have options, and each option has different advantages. 
All right. So I uh, just want to say that is the kind of the conclusion here. I just want to go over some of the terms that we talked about and some of the points. Uh, first thing we talked about degrees of freedom. There's of course six degrees of freedom, X, Y, Z, and then pitch, yaw, and roll. Um, and we talked about how linear stages constrain angular degrees of freedom. We talked about um, there are many attributes to pick from, but some of the most important ones are the number of axes, the range of stage travels, load capacity, and then straightness of travel. The key measurement for a linear stage is straightness of travel in arc seconds. That's your performance, and typically that is determined by your bearing ways. Um, bearing types imply performance, of course. Dovetail, high loads, but not as good as in terms of straightness. Ball bearing is uh, excellent price, but mid-range performance. Cross roller is typically higher loads and better straightness of travel. And then the final one is extended contact, which is kind of uh, the top performer of all. Yeah, the extended contact bearings have the best, yeah, best performance overall. Um, they have far fewer parts, so far less to, to uh, come loose, far fewer things to break. Application determines stages, advantages, and disadvantages. So as I said, there's no one stage that uh, works for everything. And the last thing here was remember that there are actually not just one, but you have actually have three different types of options when you're looking at a, a vertical travel or a z-axis stage. So with that, um, just want to open up the floor, see if there's any questions uh, on the on the stages or anything like that. If so, uh, please let me know. This is sort of random, but uh, how many tries did it take to get the, how many the car onto the bearings? I mean, oh, yeah. your stages. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, honestly, the so, um, we what we did was we just simply placed uh, the four stages um, in front of the tires, in front of the four tires, and um, what Dan was able to do, he kind of rocked his car back and forth, and he didn't want to overshoot, so he kind of rolled it, and he stopped just at the right time. Um, it actually didn't take that long. It, uh, we got that thing up there pretty quickly, and uh, uh, I would say maybe it took maybe, what, 30 seconds to get it up there, but yeah, it was no problem at all. Uh, re really impressive. Yeah, they, I mean, honestly, they are the, the stages are amazing. I mean, I, I was uh, I, I didn't believe it. I, I I didn't think that was gonna work, but they you know they did it. And that car, I think that car weighs like what thirty five hundred pounds or something like that. It's I mean, it's not light. Yeah, if I could add a comment, this is Dan Dennison, uh, Optus Sigma. I'm going to do the MHX mount shortly. If I could just add a comment, I could just tell you all that the extended contacts are used by a lot of different, you know, companies and researchers in the industry. And we know from testimonials that, you know, even for some of the high-end laser manufacturers out there, they choose these stages because of their performance. And when we compare pricing, I'm not just trying to do a sales pitch here, but I'm trying to say that um, they're extremely um, price advantage as well compared to some other other high end products on the market. So just wanted to mention that real quick. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, it's um, yeah, the pricing is it's amazing. Aside from the performance. But uh, are there any other questions uh, on the uh, on the stages or how to select them. All right. Well, um, I guess uh, if, if there aren't any questions, um, maybe we can take this time. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dan Dennison. He's our sales director, and uh, he is going to present um, an all-new mirror mount. It's a stainless steel, steel ah, sorry, stainless steel mirror mount uh, that was just introduced. I want to say maybe like uh, three months ago. And so with that. Uh, Dan, are you ready to uh, load up here? I, actually, I think I need, I probably need to uh, stop sharing here. 
I'm all set, Rick. Let me share my screen. Thanks for the introduction. And let me get into a presentation mode here. All right. Rick, can you see the screen? I'll assume everyone else can. I can yes. see it. Wonderful. Well, as Rick said, I want to thank everyone for joining today. It's a great opportunity to be able to talk about some technology and some products to U of A affiliate members. And without further ado, I'm just going to go through this slide deck. It's a much shorter slide deck. This will be a quicker presentation. And just to give you an idea, it's going to feature, as Rick mentioned, our new MHX high stability stainless steel mirror mount. And so this new mirror mount family, we're really pleased to introduce it. It is, I mentioned, a high stability mirror mount. It incorporates all stainless steel and it's made for one mirrors. The key feature is here that it the architecture of the mount is a hollow frame design. And the reason why we did a hollow frame design, in fact, Rick Sebastian, your presenter on the stages, is the architect and designer of this mount. And the reason why it was designed with a hollow frame is for it to have a higher moment of inertia to maximize stiffness, but also for it to be thinner and to be the smaller smallest possible with reduced mass sections. So the idea there is for it to be able to reach its thermal equilibrium faster than traditional design mount. So thermal stability is really important and it was one of the main key factors in the design process of creating this mount. And we'll talk more about, I have some data in some of the further slides we can talk about for thermal stability. Um, the MHX mount is loaded with additional features, as it says here, and I'll show you those on the next slide, but things like center post mounting, adhesive wells for bonding the optic to the mount, and keying pin slots for good repeatability of mounting down to a surface. And we basically say all of this in the most compact and affordable stainless mount on the market. So this is a little bit of a left slide. I'm gonna spend some time here and I'm gonna to talk to you about the features of the MHX mount. So features are for the kinematic pad material, we're using polished sapphire. These are where all the contact points are for the adjustment screws. As I mentioned before, we're talking about all stainless steel and this is the mount body, the bushings, and the adjustment screws are all stainless. And we think this is an important factor for thermal stability. And to secure the optic in place, we're using a set screw with a torsion barrier, and that's done here. And then we're also incorporating a feature called center post mounting. And this to me is really the biggest benefit aside from the thermal stability of the mount. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit as I drag the video to the top here. And I think everybody can see on the bottom right hand side here. And what this is showing is a cross section of the mount looking down from the top. And this area here that I'm dragging my mouse across is the optic itself, the mirror. And the front surface of the mirror is basically centered over the center hole, the center mounting hole. And what this really does is it enables you to steer a beam 90 degrees while staying on the whole pattern. So I don't have a pictorial to show you of this effect, but if you can picture and visualize turning this mirror mount to steer a beam 90 degrees, with most mounts on the market, what you'll do, what the effect that will happen is when you turn the mount, eventually the beam will walk across the optic all the way to the side of the mount and it will literally clip the mount before you can turn that beam 90 degrees. And that's because the optic face is not in line with the center hole mounting. And so this feature is really key. It's great convenience for users to stay on the hole pattern. I know that on optical tables, some of you might be using pedestals where you're off the hole pattern, but if you're able to maintain by using pulse holders, it's certainly a great feature to look for in a mount, and we have designed that into this one. And then the next feature I have listed down there are the adhesive wells for bonding. They can be seen here. There's three of them. They're very small little holes. You could put a syringe through there to bond the mount 
excuse me, the optic to the mount. And then I mentioned dowel pin keys, a uh, slot and a hole. And these are found, actually you can see this is a slot and this is a hole. And again, that's to be utilizing to give you repeatability for mounting down to the same location on a table or on a plate. And then surface plate mounting capability. What this really means is that we can attach these knobs, the adjustment knobs to the mount and we can bolt the mount directly down to a surface and we can still turn the knobs. That's a nice feature to have. And then uh, basically what we're saying here is that locks are available and the screw on knobs are available. We provide those separately because not all users want to utilize the locks and or the knobs. So we'll show you a little bit more of that. Um, the other thing that you can see here that I didn't mention was obviously you can see the design of the mount on the inside. And this is what we mean by a hollow frame. So we have thinner walls here for less mass. And those bits that we mentioned on the previous page of being able to reach its thermal equilibrium faster than traditional mounts. Okay. And then general specifications here, we mentioned it's a one inch holder. It is rear loading. We've got some additional product coming out that will be front loading as well. The minimum thickness that the mount can accept is three millimeters. And then there are three adjusters. So with three adjusters, we can actually yield linear translation up to seven millimeters, which in turn means that the adjustment screws are fairly long. But the angular adjustment range is plus minus three degrees in both pitch and yaw. And then the adjuster screws themselves are M6 by 250 micron or 102 threads per inch. Nice fine adjustment with those. And then we're listing the envelope and mass sizes here as well as the specific frame thickness, excuse me, stiffness. And then I'm gonna show you probably some of the most interesting information here about the performance, which all has to do with the thermal deflection testing that we did. So the graph that I'm showing you is basically showing you three temperature cycles that we ran and the performance of the mount through those cycles. So on the left-hand side, we have micro as a value. On the right-hand side, we have temperature range. And then the two plots on the top of the graph are showing the temperature of the chamber and then the temperature of the mount. So you can imagine in a, in a thermal test chamber, you have to heat the chamber up to a higher degree in order to get the mount up as well. So that's what we've done here. And basically what we're showing is that from a nominal position, after each of these cycles, we're showing deflection of the mount in both yaw and pitch to come back to within about 1.4 microradians of its original position or its nominal position, which is really a great um, performance um, fact. And so we know that uh, applications out there require demanding thermal stability, both commercially and in laboratories for research. And we made sure that in the development of this that we were able to yield that with the product. Okay, and moving on to the next, I just wanna show you a quick 2D lines here of the mounts. And basically I wanted to get across the point that there's two different types of mounting holes to mount this down. Um, and there are two surfaces on the mount that have these mounting holes. So if we wanted to mount this down to, let's say an M4 pulse holder using a set screw, we can utilize that here on the center post mounting hole. And if we wanted to mount down with an 832 set screw, we could do the same thing except for on the other side of the mount. So if we picture it here, for instance, the M4 would be here and the 832 would be here. We just flip the mount basically to get to the different metric or imperial thread. And then on each of these sides, we also have a 4.5 through hole to utilize a cap head, a socket head cap head um, screw. So you have options there for mounting. And then Rick, correct me if I'm wrong, is the center height of the optic one inch? Uh, yeah, Dan, um, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. 
the uh, you can see on the far left the picture the, the front face of the mirror mount um, where it says uh, 25.4 two places so that yeah. other dimension also applies uh, in the vertical dimension dimension as well super thank you okay and then just real quick i mentioned earlier that we provide the mount separate from the knobs and the locks because not all users want to incorporate all of them so that's why we have three different model number listed as well and you know i didn't mention it earlier but the knobs are very simple and easy to screw off or to remove and unscrew which is not the case for a lot of the mounts on the market today it's a nice feature and then these small little locks are utilized by when you screw them onto the adjustment screws here and get them near flush to the surface, you would basically turn these small set screws that would cause the lock itself to pull up and bind the adjustment screw. So that's how those locks are utilized. Okay, and so in summary, I told you this was pretty short. So in summary, we're basically reminding you that this is an all stainless steel construction utilizing a stiff hollow frame design with excellent thermal stability and repeatability and we've shown that in the data and that the standard and center post mounting features are available along with the built-in dowel pin keys and the adhesive wells um, we don't want to make this too pitchy i know this is a bit of a sales pitch but i do want to let you know that you know the price of this mount is uh, very very competitive in the market so not only did we design this with all the features in place to be able to perform well, but we knew that it had to be at a, a great price point as well. So we'd encourage you to take a look at our website, you find it on our website, or you can call us or email us with any questions and we can provide anyone interested with data. So with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you again. And of course, if there's any questions, uh, we'd be glad to answer them about the mount as well. Super. Well, hey, I guess um, I guess that about does it for our presentation. For our presentation. If I could just if mention, just uh, mention uh, tips uh, listening, tips listening. Optus Sigma Optus manufacturing is a significant, a significant amount, amount of, of optic, optic and optomechanics, and optomechanics. both standard and custom. And we'd be glad to hear from you to try and support whatever you're doing at the university. So thank you again. Hey, Dan, got a quick question. Is this vacuum compatible? Hi, Mal. Hi. This, this mount is not technically vacuum compatible, but we can easily modify it by changing the grease to make it vacuum compatible. Thank you. So, um, thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to quickly introduce Mao, who is uh, our uh, um, academic person. <laughs> you want to you wanna say hi, <laughs> Mao? Hello everyone. Um, my name is Mao. Uh, uh, we were Yoko and I had a pleasure to uh, attend an industry affiliate two months ago, Yoko. Yes. And had a chance to meet everyone. So uh, as Dan and Rick mentioned, you know, any question, please feel free to connect with us. And uh, you know, I mean, in terms of Mount, I mean, Rick is definitely a great person, and Dan himself also to connect. So thanks again. Well. I guess um, that would conclude our presentation. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, we were very um, appreciative with uh, industry affiliate programs, and then we hope you know keep working with you guys and um, stay safe. Well, thanks again. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, everyone. Dan and Rick and Mao. Thank you for coming in to speak with us today. We really appreciated it. And we'll hear more from you later, I'm sure. So, all right. As Yoko said, okay. everybody stay safe and have a good one. Thank all you. Right. Bye. 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 Take care, everyone. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye.